Good morning, everyone. How is everyone? Good. I am so excited to finally uh, be back in the United States. As Mark had mentioned to you, the last four months I have spent flying around the world in a single engine airplane. So my airplane only had one engine uh, in a very confined space. So really, this plane, you can't get up to go to the bathroom or stretch your legs. Uh, I was really confined just to the seat of the pilot seat. And I traveled around the world by myself in this plane, all to inspire the next generation. So boys and girls just like you, or mainly girls uh, and boys just like you, and to promote science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM careers. Uh, and the reason why I feel so passionate about this is because, as Mark had mentioned to you, uh, I uh, am a refugee from Afghanistan, came to the United States. I grew up with five sisters, so at home I had, uh, there was six girls. And I just thought to myself, I'm not good in school, I don't like to read, I don't like math. Uh, really, my only aspirations in life were to get married and have a big family, um, just as women from Afghanistan have done for g many generations. And then one day, out of the blue, um, I had the opportunity to go on a commercial flight. It was a Delta Airlines flight. And it's interesting, because I grew up my whole life so afraid of flying. Anyone in here afraid of flying? Okay, well you know how I feel. I was just so terrified. Uh, but when I went on this Delta airplane, facing my fear at the age of 17, sitting in the back of this airplane thinking, I, in my mind I'm thinking this plane is gonna launch into the sky and it's gonna be like a roller coaster. Um, and just trembling. And as soon as this plane took off, I was just surprised, I was amazed. It was a very graceful lift off into the sky and every nautical mile that we were moving forward, I just, I felt drawn to aviation. I started to feel something that I had never felt before and that was curiosity. I was curious to know how is this plane flying? How are we going from one part of the United States to the other? And I was also a little dumbfounded that I had spent 17 years of my life afraid of flying, and it, it actually happened to be one of the best things that had ever happened to me. So I often tell young kids, sometimes your greatest, uh, your greatest fears in life are, could be your greatest passion, and you won't know until you go out there and you face those fears. I'd like to take a few minutes to uh, show you a quick video. There's going to be a lot of videos that are going to be played because I'm sure you don't want to hear me talking this whole time. Uh, but this video is to help introduce to you a little bit more about my mission uh, during this around the world flight. And uh, it, it really, the goal was to inspire the next generation to be brave, uh, to go after careers that usually women are not um, pursuing, and those are careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Anyone in here interested in STEM? Science, technology, engineering, and math? Maybe? Okay, I want to ask after the couple of videos that I show you, because I'm curious to see uh, what you all think about it, but when I was first introduced to this concept of STEM, I really didn't know what science meant or what technology, engineering, or math. You know, I just thought, a scientist was some person in the back of a laboratory in a lab coat, um, and maybe a mathematician was someone who would love to do pre-calculus and equations, but it's so much more than that, and I hope to introduce you to that. But this video, Dream Soar is a nonprofit organization that I helped start, that I actually founded um, a couple years ago, and our sole mission is to inspire the next generation. And you'll kind of see around throughout the room uh, a team wearing blue shirts that says Dream Store. And these are all members of our team um, that has not only helped me fly around the world to help inspire the next generation, but they're working on the daily operations of uh, the organization. So with that said, it's a three minute video that we'll show you and then um, we'll talk about STEM. Psst. Hey you. Yeah, you. 
Let me have your attention for a second. Let's play a game. I'm going to count down from five, and I want you to name, off the top of your head, five iconic female pilots. And go! Ooh, that was easy. Next question. Oh, too quick? Okay, let's try it again. Together now. One, Amelia Earhart. Two, uh, <laughs> did I say five? Not easy, right? Don't worry, you're not alone. That's because there aren't many female pilots. In fact, there are only about 450 female airline captains worldwide. They all could be seated on a single Airbus A380. In terms of the airline pilots worldwide, only 0.6% are women. Now, that'd be understandable in 1920, 30, 40, 50, even 60s. But in 2016, unacceptable. And it's not just in aviation. It's across many industries. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute. Girls in America are free to do and be anything they want. And it's true. But in other countries, women still don't have the right to vote, drive, and do things that we take for granted. And that's where Dream Soar comes in. Imagine for a second, a world, a more balanced world, where children across the globe, whatever their circumstances may be, have the ability to study science, technology, engineering, and math. A balanced world. And that's what Shasta Waze imagined after she became a pilot. Born in a refugee camp in Afghanistan, Shasta came to the United States at a tender age with her parents. After graduating high school, she embarked on her first commercial flight as a gift to celebrate her achievement though previously being scared of flight. But once the wheels of her jet airliner were no longer grounded, the thrill of flight was enough to push her fears behind her. Her newfound passion motivated her to not only move across the country, but to follow her dreams and become a pilot. Shasta considered her story and thought how it could impact the world. She began to imagine this world where children, especially young girls, could dream, could learn, could be curious. Inspired by her mentor, Jerry Mock, Shasta is going to fly around the world, solo, making strategic stops in countries where STEM education is lacking. There, she will team up with local organizations and host events promoting STEM and aviation to young women and students. Her earth-rounding trip will make her the youngest woman to fly solo. And while Shasta is excited about that, she is more focused and passionate about inspiring the next generation. Just as she has started here, Dream Soar is supported by the most capable advisors and sponsored by a host of industry partners. The initiative is being engineered by college students known as the Dream Team, who use their education and skills to drive the Dream Soar mission. And now you, yes, you, have an opportunity to join us on this journey as we travel around the world. Visit our website, subscribe to our newsletter, and connect with Dream Soar on social media. Take our challenges, share our stories, and support Dream Soar in this incredible adventure to open the world to the next generation of STEM and aviation professionals. Now, when I ask you to name five iconic female pilots, you won't all have to shout at once. All right. So that's a little bit about Dream Soar and uh, some information behind the purpose of this around the world flight. So I kind of mentioned a little bit that when I was a little girl, I didn't like to read, I didn't like math, um, and, and I think a lot of it was because, uh, unfortunately, I grew up in a very poor school district, and um, I remember one day I was in elementary school, and my teacher said, students, do not come to class tomorrow because uh, our, the elementary school is being shut down due to a lack of funding. And so there I am as a student hearing this, that I don't have to go to school tomorrow. And I'm like, yes, I don't have to go to school tomorrow. Uh, and later on, we were all matriculated into the different schools around my area. But I didn't know this back then, but growing up um, in Richmond, California, and not taking school seriously really hurt me a lot when I discovered aviation and I wanted to become a pilot. 
Uh, also, too, the STEM uh, subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, I was just very intimidated by it. I thought, geez, I don't even want to begin to figure out a math equation or participate in any of the science fairs. It just, it was a territory that I was not familiar with and I often just kind of shut myself off. But here's the truth, STEM. And I saw very, uh, a very small amount of hands go up of those who are interested in STEM. STEM is all around us. It is in almost every career field that you can imagine. You know, I, I kind of thought about how does STEM relate to aviation? And then I thought about this trip around the world and I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm using science uh, by pulling up all of these weather charts that uses uh, scientific research and scientific analysis of what the weather patterns are doing. Um, that as I fly around the world, I have a good understanding of what am I going to be faced with when I'm up in the sky by myself flying over countries that I have never visited. Um, technology. So we have such great technology today that Back in the day when Amelia Earhart flew around the world, she navigated through the stars. And in this day and age, we have GPS, and that allowed me to get from one country to another very quickly and very efficiently. So I wasn't faced with this, you know, do I have the correct uh, heading? Am I going to actually see an airport once I, I get into the country or the airspace? Um, and with the use of iPads, it was instantaneous. I could file my flight plan, I could pull up weather charts, and this is what technology allowed me to do as a pilot. Engineering. Uh, I think engineering is, it's very exciting, and how we use engineering is, you'll see a picture of my plane, and we had to engineer fuel tanks, because my plane is very small. It didn't have the range, the ability to fly uh, the airplane long distances. So we engineered fuel tanks uh, to allow me to cross the oceans and long legs um, so, I, th so that I could actually get around the world without making a lot of stops. And when you're flying across the Pacific Ocean, you really don't have any airport to land in to get more fuel. So the engineering of this, these ferry fuel tanks was really the reason why I was able to get around the world. And then mathematics. Um, I've never been strong in math. Uh, I've been very intimidated by it. But as a pilot, I used it to determine my rate of descent, to determine uh, when you're crossing an ocean as a pilot, you determine your uh, point of no return. And that's a point where once you cross that point, you will no longer have uh, sufficient fuel to turn back around to the airport that you took off from. And that's a number that you want to know before you're crossing the Pacific Ocean. So. Using math in that way um, really helped me, again, going to, to get around the world. And here I was thinking, STEM is so scary, it doesn't really uh, apply to me, but yet it, it did in every, uh, in every aspect of this trip around the world. And if you look into the different fields, you'll find that in this day and age, STEM is used across every industry in every field. And I'm trying to encourage young girls to be a part of this, uh, th this way to the future. Because to be honest with you, STEM careers are very male dominated. And they have gotten very far. STEM has gotten very far, especially in the United States. But there's one thing that they are lacking in, in the STEM fields, and that's more women. And by having more women, that's more diversity more different way of thinking, different way of approaching the STEM fields, and it's, it's critical. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to kind of deep, deep, sorry, dig deeper into STEM. Uh, and one of our dream team members who's here today, Michael Wilds, he's actually back there with the camera <laughs> in the blue shirt. Uh, Michael Wilds is uh, a student who graduated uh, he's a, a pilot as well, and although he loves to fly, he just became a certified flight instructor, his passion is also uh, videography. So he took the time during his flight training to create this 
very cool STEM video to give you more insights about what's, what is STEM and um, how it may apply to the real world. And hopefully it will inspire you to kind of think twice about the careers uh, in these fields. So uh, it's about a 13 minute video and we'll go ahead and play it now. Have you ever wondered what it takes to send a spacecraft to the edges of the Earth? Or even how you could get to fly one? Have you ever wondered how music is able to stream into small headphones and magnify so loudly into your ears? Many of the things we have today did not exist too long ago. The way we live our lives, the medicines we take when we get sick, how we travel and keep connected with the world all evolve very quickly because of people who work in the STEM fields. But what is STEM? STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Some of the companies that support the Dream Soar flight have people who work in STEM that make their products. Someday, this could be you. Some of the jobs you might have in a STEM field might be as a geologist, meteorologist, biologist, veterinarian, technician, pilot, computer programmer, oceanographer, or even as a doctor. Dr. Smith uses science in her job as a surgeon every day. In her medical training to become a doctor, she was required to learn all about the human body, how it works, what makes it sick, and how to make it better. To do this, biology, chemistry, math, physics, and many more subjects are studied in books and in a real hospital. Today, Dr. Smith uses the x-ray machine to see inside the bodies of her patients to help safely perform surgeries. Marie Curie did this over 100 years ago, and it still helps doctors to this day. Technology is also making our world more fun and a lot easier. It wasn't too long ago that we had to wait several days to get our photos developed from film. We couldn't even take selfies. Texting, email, Facebook, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Instagram, and tweeting. It was all known as writing a letter. Careers using skills and technology often work with computers, smartphones, software, the internet, and satellites, things we already use and know well. It's amazing to think that what looks like a star from Earth is a million pound laboratory, 220 miles away, where up to six scientists from all over the world are doing research in space. But how did it get there? And how do we send people to live there and bring them home? Aerospace engineers, electrical engineers, and physicists use everything that they've studied to propel the people and spacecraft into space and create the space station. The environment in space is very different from that of Earth. So, for the astronaut to survive in the different environment, engineers have to simulate Earth's environment to the best of their capabilities. Math is everywhere. It is involved in just about everything we see, hear, and do. That's why numbers are one of the first things we learn. What can we do with math at a very young age? What if your teacher intends to bring apples for every student in class? How does she know she has enough for everyone? She has to count. What is another way we use math? How about when we count money? The government has to put together budgets in order to properly distribute their country's wealth. You have to use math for these calculations. Because of math, a government is able to provide for its citizens today and also into the future. And there are many other ways that you can use math, from building bridges, to drawing maps, to even planning a space launch. A great mathematician is Katherine Johnson. 
In the past, women were employed to do math as human computers. Katherine Johnson, being one of those human computers, did the complex math that put the first American into space. As you can see, with math, the sky is not even the limit. STEM careers are for everyone. As you can see, careers in science, technology, engineering, and math can be exciting. As you learn more about STEM, you begin to learn more about the world around you. It all makes us feel a little more connected. And we hope it makes your dreams soar higher than you could ever imagine. Honeywell is committed to making aviation safer for passengers, crew, and pilots. If you look at the aerospace industry, really the sky is the limit, but Honeywell makes almost everything on an airplane. We make everything from the propulsion engines, to the wheels and brakes, and the avionics up in the cockpit. Honeywell uses science, technology, engineering, and math every day, whether it be in the engineering field, designing our next future technologies, or on the business side, through mathematics and finance, and analysis, and growing our business to new markets. What if I told you that a pilot is the captain of their own lives? They control their destination and the route to get there. Every one of you is a pilot every day in your own lives, so take charge control your destination, and enjoy the flight along the way. I want to be an electrical engineer. I want to be an engineer. I would like to thank Honeywell for the opportunity because if I'm inspired, I know other students have been inspired too to do similar things that I've done and it really propels us toward the future. I think all of us can relate to Shasta's passion. She's a young woman who followed her heart and pursued her dreams. She never let a little turbulence slow her down. And Honeywell is so proud to be at the forefront with Shasta and helping her follow her dreams and share that message with the rest of the world. So, Stand by and, and they'll be playing here soon. What were the chances of your survival? So slim. So slim. Doctors had no problem telling me that four years ago, medicine and technology wouldn't have been available, hadn't been developed yet, to save my life. Well, what I really remember is not that much. I, uh, my eyes opened and I saw treetops above my head and I remember just saying, get to your feet. And that's all I remember really from the location where my injury happened, is just saying, get to my feet after I was electrocuted. I was hiking in Montana, not far down the road, elk hunting, and um, saw sort of this bundle of fur that caught my eye. So I went to check it out and I just pulled my knife out and put it in my left hand to just say, hey, what do we got here, what is that? And when I did that, um, little did I know that there was 2,400 volts of live power in the ground underneath underneath it. You know, we have, uh, I guess, 110 volt outlets in our home. 200 times that, give or take, you know, a lot, a lot. Walked three miles down to the valley floor. And I made it to a cabin, a gentleman there called the ambulance, 911, and I, within an hour, I was on a med jet to Salt Lake City, uh, the burn trauma in ICU. The electricity takes the path of least resistance, at least in, in the body, and so it travels through your blood veins. And I had nine exit wounds. This is after my amputation. And I see some very cool items here on the yeah, table cool. that allows you to do amazing things. Yes. So I'll let you tell us what they are. These three here are what you would call a myoelectric prosthesis. So they run off of electricity batteries mm -hmm. and are triggered by muscle impulses. Basically, those sensors, initially all they pick up is the open-closed motion. 
It's right. the computer. It's the technology in the computer that then takes the series of. So you can see my forearm is ah, flexing, right? So it's opening. I see. Closing, right? Just like this one is, right? For me, the myoelectrics are changing the game for amputees that have very little use of any of their limbs. With technology and science today, we can open and close a five-fingered articulated moving myoelectric hand. That's me cooking with the ILM Ultra. It's an interesting shot because it's, it's everything we know. It's a cutting board, it's a knife, it's mm -hmm. vegetables. We don't often see sort of a very technological, robotic looking hand. It's working with that hand that really gave me that title, the bionic chef. I'm a chef by trade, you know, mm -hmm. we talked about that, and the, the word bionic chef came about because irregardless of my injuries, I put a prosthesis back on, and with my prosthetician in Portland at Advanced Arm Dynamics, they, you know, say, put a metal plate in here so I can crack shells of, you know, an almond or a walnut, crab claws, lobster claws. It's light enough that I'm not fatigued. It's made out of carbon fiber, so I can wear it all day. Basically, with the technology that's around today, I was able to get back into a kitchen and start cooking again, but really using sort of my prosthesis as a skill set, not as a detriment. So this pan is piping hot, so I could grab that right now. And not yeah, I, 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 I can I do that. that yeah. right now. So there's the ups and downs to it where I won't burn my fingers, won't cut my fingers. Correct. Um, and then bionic, as I understand it, is sort of the... Um, the application of technology and, and medicine mm -hmm. as it relates to bio, different, like bio, through nature, Correct. through natural movements, and in my case, the human body. Correct. So I am using sort of technology as my hand. I would, I would give students the same message that I heard and that I took when I was lying in bed in ICU trying to figure out, I had a huge problem. I'm a chef, I had a career, you know, I was 30 years old, and all of a sudden I just lost a limb. Game changer. What am I going to do now? How am I going to survive and pay bills and everything else? And it's a big problem. It's a big equation. So you break it down. And that's what I would encourage students to do. When you have something up against you or in front of you that you are intrigued by or challenged by or scared by or hesitant about, take a step back, break it down into manageable units. Make it smaller than it really is. One bite at a time. One bite at a time. That is done. Oh, this is really good. This is really good. I'd eat that again. Wow. Back in 2014, and there's one more STEM video uh, that I think you all will enjoy, and it's gonna play here shortly. We spend so much of our lives driving from place to place. I'm just gonna stop. Right here? Yes, save us a seat. Shouldn't it be easier and safer to get where we want to go? Since 2009, our team at Google has been developing fully self-driving technology and testing it on real city streets every single day. Until, after more than a million miles, we were ready to take a big step forward. In 2015, we completed the world's first truly driverless ride on public roads. Just a person in a car, no steering wheel, no pedals, navigating everyday traffic. Well, I've never been in Austin, Texas. Now I'm driving in Austin, Texas. It's a profound experience for me to be alone in a car. A very important segment of my life was cut away when my vision failed. And a self-driving car would give me a huge part of my life back. This is just the beginning. We're looking ahead to a new way, a better way for everyone. Say hello to Waymo.
All right. So by a show of hands, uh, anyone in here now interested in STEM after having a better understanding of what science, technology, engineering, and math careers really entail? Any hands? All right, well, that's more than what we started with. Um, but really what I wanted you all to walk away with today is uh, at least understanding what STEM careers are all about. Um, normally when I ask young kids about STEM, it's this vague understanding of what these careers are really about. And the, uh, the, the honest truth is, is that our, the way that our society is moving, STEM is what's going to really help revolutionize um, some of the uh, advancements that we hope to have in the near future. And it's important to inspire the next generation to be a part of uh, the big STEM movement. And what was really cool is for the last four months, I've had the opportunity to go around the world to 20 different countries and talk to young girls just like you uh, from Greece, Spain, England, Afghanistan, uh, India, and introduce STEM to them and get them excited about these careers. So to be able to come back to the United States and to present uh, STEM to you all is really a treat for me. So a little bit more about the trip. Uh, first off, I want to say um, something that I hope you all take into heart is that success is never achieved alone. And although I was able to successfully fly solo around the world, meaning I was by myself in the airplane, there was nobody else there uh, but myself, um, I couldn't have done this without our partners, our supporters, the dream team, the dream store team. Um, and I've, I've heard this quote that success is never achieved alone, but it really hit home as I was going around the world by myself to know that there is a team uh, here in the United States working around the clock to make sure that I'm uh, safe, that the events that we had planned out are all in place. and. Um, that everyone was informed about the progress of the trip. And one of our partners, has anyone in here ha have heard of ICAO? You have, do you know what it stands for? No, okay, it's the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, ICAO, and they're really the governing body uh, where countries from around the world come together and talk about uh, the commercial aviation industry and how to, to make sure that um, commercial aviation is safe around the world and um, finding the correct regulations to make sure that it's efficient uh, and safe. So ICAO being one of our partners, um, they were very key into uh, making sure as I made my way around the world that uh, all of the countries were informed of my arrival and tried to make it as uh, easy and seamless on me and also ICAO was able to coordinate um, events for young kids to come out to the airport or for me to go and present to them to talk to them about aviation and STEM careers. Um, so ICAO is a, a great partner and I just really want to take this opportunity to thank them. Um, but again, success is never achieved alone and so many people have helped me get across and around the world. Um, and this aircraft. So is this the airplane that you were envisioning as I was telling you about the airplane that I'm flying around the world? No? It's way smaller. <laughs> Do you all think you would be able to get into this plane and make your way around the world? Yeah? I love those answers. Yes, you all can. Uh, but this is the aircraft that I took around the world. It's a Beechcraft Bonanza. And uh, this plane is a six-seater plane, but what's interesting is we removed all of the seats from the plane. So my co-pilot was this big 59-gallon aluminum fuel tank. <laughs> and then my passenger behind me was another 120-gallon aluminum fuel tank. So pretty much this plane was a flying fuel tank, and I was just the pilot uh, sitting next to it. Um, but this airplane, uh, for it to be a single engine airplane, it really impressed me, the performance um, that this plane had, especially on the, the flights where I was carrying a lot of fuel. Just imagine, you know, when I took off from Hawaii, 
Uh, I crossed the Pacific Ocean nonstop from Hawaii to California. And I flew for 14 and a half hours straight. No sleeping, no getting up, no stretching. Um, and the fact that this airplane had the performance to do that, especially on the takeoff, how I like to describe my takeoff from Hawaii, is that it's like a fly trying to carry a bee on its back. The plane was so heavy from all the fuel that I had on board that um, I was very worried about the climb performance after I took off from Hawaii. But to my surprise, the engineers who designed this airplane, especially the engine, did a phenomenal job. And that departure out of Hawaii was uh, um, a very safe and uh, departure and, it, and the climb performance was much better than I had expected. But uh, this is the plane that I took around the world and you can kind of see the country flags. I was able to visit 20 different countries uh, across five continents and um, I crossed both the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, uh, which was very interesting and it was a lot of fun too. So this is kind of an overview of the route that I flew. I started off in Florida, made my way up to Montreal, Canada, where ICAO's headquarters is. I, uh, then I went to St. John's, Canada. I crossed the Atlantic Ocean, so you can kind of see where the Atlantic Ocean is. That little, it's an island called Santa Maria um, in Portugal. I landed there, I had one day to rest, got back in the plane, I flew to Spain and then just kind of made my way out from uh, to Spain, England, Italy, um, Greece. Then I went over to Africa uh, where I had a stop in Egypt. Then to Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Oman. Um, then over to India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Singapore, um, Indonesia, Australia. Then you can kind of see, I took, if you look at where Australia is, I, there was a series of South Pacific Islands that took me up to Hawaii. Then from Hawaii, I did the big jump across the Pacific Ocean to California. So my plane currently is in California and I'm still on the around the world tour. Uh, when I make it back to Florida, that's when officially the trip will conclude. And um, it's been such an exciting adventure. So I have to tell you all, you know, when I, when I told people that I'm getting ready to fly around the world solo, I got several different um, comments. And one of the comments was, is uh, you should really think about taking um, a man with you just to be on the safe side. And I thought, well, what is a man gonna do? Because at the end of the day, the airplane doesn't know if I'm a man or a woman, if I'm a refugee, if I have purple hair or my religion, that airplane re reacts solely on my, my abilities as a pilot. So it's not really man versus woman or, or any of that. It's about how proficient is the pilot to go around the world. Another comment that I heard is, uh, well, it's been done before. It's actually been done before 234 times people have gone around the world. And of that 234, only seven women have successfully flown around the world. And it dawned on me that, you know, I, I grew up thinking that, again, all that life would have to offer me was for me to be a housewife at home raising children. I, I really didn't think I was capable or smart enough to do anything more than that. And as soon as I sat in that airplane, and I felt this emotion of passion, excitement. I felt a sense of purpose. I didn't let anything stop me from that point on. You know, people were saying, well, you're not smart enough. Girls from Afghanistan, they don't fly. Um, it's hard. And all of those things are correct, but I just, it wouldn't register in my brain. I thought, no, you just don't know that feeling that I have when I get into an airplane. It is stronger than anything I've ever experienced in life, and that's what kept me going every single day. Um, it's very important, if you all don't have a passion for STEM, as I do, have a passion for something, anything in life, and go after it. 
Don't think too much about money or success. Think about what makes you happy. And when you find it, whether it's being a pilot or an astronaut or a housewife, enjoy it and you will have a more fruitful life and um, you will have far much less regrets than if you were to go after careers for uh, different reasons aside from the fact that you love it and you're passionate about it. So when I was a young girl, I thought to myself, when I would be in geography class and I'd read about Africa and India and even some states in the United States, I thought, why am I here? Why am I learning these names? Why am I learning about the world? I have no intentions of flying or ever going anywhere. And again, to my surprise, I was able to fly around the world. And although right now you may think, well, why am I in school or why am I learning this subject? Pay very close attention because you all are still very young. And by the time you graduate from high school and you start thinking about college, um, hopefully you won't be in my position where I didn't take school seriously and, it, and I had to struggle a lot to kind of bring my math, my education level to a, a level where I could apply to college and uh, be a successful college student. So just some statistics about the trip. Uh, miles flown, 22,000 miles. Uh, it's incredible. <laughs> Um, it's, it's been such a, an amazing adventure, and once I'm done with the, these pictures, I would love for those of you who have any questions to ask me um, about the trip, but the number of stops, 25, 20 countries, number of continents that I visited is five, and the number of, in, of kids that uh, we were able to inspire face to face uh, was 2,435. That's pretty cool. I got to meet so many cool kids just like you. And I have to say, they I met kids from Greece, from Afghanistan, from India, from Australia. And the truth is, is that they're no different from you. They all love the same things that you love. And they all have the same beautiful smiles as you do, and aspirations and, and ideas. And um, it was cool to introduce them to them, and, and I think that's the, one of the biggest things that I've gained from this trip. So here's some pictures from uh, Greece, and you, you can kind of see there's some kids in the background. Uh, I, this was a presentation that I was sharing with them. Mumbai, India, it was very uh, honoring because I got to go to an orphanage where I got to speak with um, a few young girls, excuse me. <clears throat> so I got to talk to the young girls that you see in the picture. All of these girls are from an orphanage, and it was really cool to share with them about the stories that I had going around the world. Singapore, um, again, these are just some pictures, some, some memories that I wanted to share with you all. But probably the biggest uh, stop for me that was very emotional was going back to Afghanistan. And I hadn't been back there since I left as a, a very little girl. I was uh, about three months old. And in the picture that you see with the gentleman, that's the president of Afghanistan welcoming me to the presidential palace. And I just thought to myself, as I'm walking around the presidential palace getting ready to meet him, I thought, like, who am I that the president is making time for me to meet me. I just thought, I was just so humbled by it. And uh, you see some of the girls dressed in our traditional Avwani clothes, welcoming me, giving me uh, flowers. And when we were there, the United Nations had hosted an event with, with about, uh, I believe it was about 100 girls. And one of them kind of ran out and she came up to me and she asked me, she said, why are you here? You live such a peaceful, beautiful life in the United States. Why did you come to Afghanistan where there's still a lot of um, bombings going on and you know the Taliban is just 20 miles away from the capital? 
And I looked at her and I said, I came here for you to let you know that you matter, that yes, I'm flying around the world and I have the opportunity to go to a lot of countries, but I wanted to come here to show you that at the end of the day, we're all humans. And us women, we are capable of doing these great things. And it was very important for me to go back to my country and to show those young women who have experienced a lot of hardships that they are capable of doing something like flying around the world. Um, it's just because of their lack of opportunities and their circumstances that they're so limited. And she was just surprised. She was just shocked. So that was a, a really cool experience. And then you see me. Uh, the girls in the uniform, they dressed up as pilots in honor of me. Um, all of them hope to fly someday, uh, but once the country kind of is restructured and uh, some of the, the bombing stop and the fighting stops, I know that the government has a lot of plans to continue to promote aviation within the country. But that was a, a very cool experience. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to open the floor. If you have any questions about the trip, about STEM, about anything you can think of, don't be shy uh, and please let me know. Yes? How did I think that's the number one question that I get is, how did you use the bathroom? And when I um, started to do some research, unfortunately, a lot of the guys, or a lot of the pilots that I spoke to who have flown around the world were men. And I'm like, well, I can't ask them. But um, there's something called a travel john. And they use it for people who go hiking. Um, if you Google it, there will be a lot more information. but as I mentioned, I couldn't really get up or walk. There, there is no bathroom in the plane. Um, so I just had to get really creative. Uh, and I used a travel john. So, yeah. Can you come to the mic? That's a really good question. So there were, there were a couple times where um, I was, I wouldn't say I was afraid, but I was definitely uh, nervous. And when I flew from, um, from Egypt to Bahrain, I flew over Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, I flew over the desert. And for three hours, I had experienced some of the hardest the harshest turbulence I had ever experienced in my life. So for three hours, I sat there in this position, holding on to uh, the yoke and the power, and just ready for anything to happen. I mean, the plane, it was just fighting um, as it was flying with the turbulence. And unfortunately, over the desert, there are no roads. There's nobody. There's nowhere where you can really plan for an emergency landing if something were to go wrong. But being in that position for three hours and the plane's just going back and forth and climbing and descending and uh, just trying to maintain my altitude and airspeed, once that three hours was done, I was just so grateful for like peace and smooth air. Um, and once I landed in Bahrain, I reached out to one of my friends who flew around the world, and I said, geez, I just encountered some of the worst turbulence you could, I could have ever imagined. And he said, yeah, we all do. It's, it's something we just try not to tell you so that you go through it. But uh, yeah, over the desert, you usually encounter a lot of turbulence. But you know, it was interesting, because as I was approaching the desert, I just thought, my gosh, I've never been to a desert before. And I'm flying over it at 9,000 feet. It was just so surreal that here I was 
right over Saudi Arabia flying. And it was very cool for me to experience the world at seven, nine, or 11,000 feet. That's a good question. Any other questions? Yes. How did I sleep on my journey? I did not sleep. Uh, and some people ask me, well, what did you do to stay awake? And the thing is, is you just have to look down, and that will wake you up real quickly, uh, especially if you're flying over an ocean. But um, my longest leg was 14 and a half hours, and I think the shortest leg that I had was about three and a half hours. So, it, it ranged a lot, and I would say the average flight time was maybe around eight or nine hours, um, but I didn't have an opportunity to sleep in that time because it was just me flying the plane. So that's a good question. I was getting a lot of tourists. I keep going to New York. If you had to have a crush, where would, you, where would you crash? Where would you guys first crash? That's a good question. If there was a crash landing, where would you crash? Well, uh, it, it really depends. If you were along like a coastline, usually landing um, on the, the coastline of a beach is a good place. And you have to be a little understanding of that you're making a landing in the sand. And if you come in too hard, um, your nose can dip into the sand and your plane could flip. Um, but usually looking for a road or a very unpopulated area um, those are kind of some, some places that you want to think about of landing. Um, but uh, there's been several crash landing situations with pilots, and um, especially the ones that I heard about over the ocean. Uh, luckily, they have all been saved. There was a couple that didn't survive, but um, that's when paying attention, especially in flight school, if you ever decide to become a pilot, it's those things that you can save your life, is understanding you know, what the plane is doing. Um, and if you do have any sort of engine failure, your airplane can still glide. And you just got to take advantage of those situations. So he just said, wouldn't it be better not to land on a road? Uh, maybe a farmland, absolutely. Well, I, roads are ideal because if you look at a runway, it is pretty much a road. It's just a big, long slab of pavement. Um, and the airplane, you know, it's probably the most comparable to a runway would be a paved road. Um, but then you have to think about cars and people. But landing in a field would be great, too, if you could find a nice open field um, and flying in landing the aircraft there. That's, so it's all very situational. You just have to think, wh wh what's my best option? And often, if you talk to the pilots in the room, because uh, some of our dream team members are pilots, when you're sitting there flying and you're not really doing anything, as a pilot, you're always asking yourself, if I have an engine failure right now, where am I going to land? And that's something that's just always in the back of your mind. Yes. Hi, Taylor. Yes, unfortunately, um, there were several people who said that I couldn't do it because I was a woman. And it was hard because some of those people were actually family members. And it's different when you hear it from a stranger. You're like, OK, well, you don't really know me. But when you hear it from people who are in your family, um, that really hurts. And it's interesting because now that I've made it to the mainland, they're very proud of me. Um, but I, I want to share with you all that whatever your dreams are in life, you are going to have people who are going to doubt you and come up with some reason, whether you are a woman, whether you are, I mean, it, it's just everything that you've heard up, to, up until this point, you're either not smart enough or you are girls like you don't do careers or follow or pursue the dreams that you have. 
whatever you pursue in life, you're going to have that. That's, that's just, it's the way life is, and I hate that. But some things that I have learned um, with this criticism, this negative criticism, is that I'm very grateful for it because it made me stronger as a person. It really tested, do I want to fly around the world? You know, here's someone who grew up and, and practically helped raise me, thinking, who says to me that I can't fly because I'm a woman. And it just, it motivated me to go out there and say, I can and I will. And so just be ready for that. Whatever you want to pursue in life, unfortunately, there, there will be challenges. But take those challenges in a positive way and use it to your advantage. Use that energy to make you stronger, to make you work harder. Um, because those, I call them tests in life. They're tests to see, do you really want this? Are you willing to put in the hard work? And it's also a big test of your confidence in yourself, and it just it builds you up to be a stronger person. Yes. My name is Renee, and I live in Phoenix. My question is, do you have a DVD player? Janae, okay. Janae. What is it? Janae. Janae, okay. Uh, well, you know, as I was um, doing research, I asked a few pilots, hey, what did you eat? And they're like, oh, I barely ate anything. It was like protein bars, lots of water, um, barely, you know, it was just a very tight, lean diet. And I'm a big foodie. I love to eat. And I love, like, potato chips and coffee. And so I thought, you know what, if I rest enough and if I work out, and I can eat the things that I like to eat in the plane. Um, but I had to also be careful because if I, if I were to eat something that would make me sick, then it's me in the plane for the next eight hours feeling sick, which no pilot wants to fly like that. Um, but it was mainly a, a really healthy diet, lots of sandwiches, but I did have those extra bag of chips and coffee that I would drink to. Um, and that was my diet. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, I'm Cindy Brenna, a parent from Ear Hustle. Hi. Um, you talked about food being family um, and that being a bit of a discouragement. What other kind of obstacles have women of color faced? Oh, wow. You know, um, there was a one particular individual who as a very experienced pilot, um, a pilot who has flown my particular airplane a lot. <coughs> so um, I reached out to him to kind of get some information. And from the first day that he heard about what I was doing, he has been very doubtful. And it was like, well, you can't do this. You shouldn't do this. How are you going to do this? It was just hurting my, my whole confidence that I had built up for so long. And the thing is, is I knew I could do this. I, every morning I'd wake up, I could feel it, that this is my mission in life. I'm going to fly around the world to help inspire women, women who need that confidence. And um, when I would hear these comments, it, it would sadden me and it would hurt my confidence. But, you know, even aside from that, um, you just can't let your past dictate your present or influence your presence. Uh, one thing that I learned is who cares that I'm a refugee? Who cares that I grew up in a poor school district? It doesn't matter that I grew up really extremely poor and my family struggled a lot. Those things, they are a part of my life, but they don't define who I am right now. Right now in this moment, I have studied for so many years to become the pilot that I am. And no one can tell me what my limitations are. Only I know that. And you just sometimes, you, you hear these comments and you just have to block it off. You know, there are so many pioneers in this world. And oftentimes when I'd find myself doubting myself or my ability to do this, I would read about these pioneers. And I thought, how did they have this courage to do what they were able to do? you know, when the world was doubting them or the, the world was, were, was against them. And there are the first 
there are pioneers, there are people who do things for the first time, and if they can do it, you can too. You know, just because no Afghani woman has flown a civilian airplane or held a civilian pilot's license doesn't mean that I can't be the first. So just remember, you are your biggest limitation. If someone tells you that you can't do something, don't listen to them. They think that you can't do it, but you shouldn't think that you can't do it. If I would have listened to all of the criticism that I received, I probably would still be at home, afraid to come out or to fly or to experience this adventure that I have for the last four months. So you just have to press forward, be confident, and believe in yourself. That is the most important thing. Okay. How much money do I make? Well, I'm not the traditional pilot. I know if you pursue a career as a pilot, uh, I mean, it could just range based on your experience from anywhere from $40,000 to $250,000. Yeah, I know. It's, it, but it, it's really dependent on your experience. Now, right now, I don't make any money because um, I'm doing all of this through my nonprofit organization, Dream Soar. But I don't think of wealth as how much money do I have. Right now, as I stand before you, I feel like I'm one of the richest people in the world because I just got to see the world. And not only see the world, but look into the eyes of young girls who feel so powerless and who feel that they just lost no direction, no confidence and tell them that they can do the things that they want to in life. And seeing their reactions and seeing how they, you know, after the, the talk, seeing how, just how they were and how much more confident they were, that's what wealth is for me. You know, and, and I would have done this trip over and over and over again with not a dollar in my pocket and not expecting any sort of income. Um, but now that I'm back, uh, I hope to have a career and keep building on STEM and um, continue to promote STEM education and aviation to the next generation. All right, I think that's all the time that we have. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for your attention. Go out there, conquer the world. Don't let anything hold you back. And who knows, maybe someday you will be in the STEM fields or even flying around the world. So thank you guys again. Take care.